Good evening and welcome everybody to the Burlington Board of Electric Commissioners monthly meeting. This is Wednesday, May 18th, uh, 5.30 p.m. And we are trying our first go around at a hybrid approach. So there are several of us here in the room and then uh, several of us on the screen. You'll see we're a little shy. We have two uh, commissioners who were unable to make it this evening due to uh, unanticipated uh, issues. Um, but we will kick in and apologies in advance. We're figuring this out. So presenters will be sitting there and viewers will probably see the back of their heads. But next time around, we will shift the wires and the taping around so everybody can see everybody if you're viewing from home. So first up on the agenda is the agenda itself. If anyone has any suggested edits or modifications. Hearing none. Uh, second is the approval or uh, recommended edits, uh, if it's content related, um, to the minutes from last meeting, April 13th, 2022. Wondering if either one of you identified anything you wanted to clarify or follow up on, or, or perhaps wasn't captured exactly as we had anticipated or meant. Okay, so if someone could make a motion. Move to accept as presented. Second. All in favor. <clears throat> Aye. Aye. Wow, it's so weird we don't do roll call. <laughs> I'm like, that was so fast. Uh, third is the public forum. Um, I don't I see anyone from the public here in person. No one on Teams. No one on Teams. Okay, well, for viewers, you know, you're always welcome to call in to join us now via hybrid. Um, you know, our customer care team, uh, led by Mike Kenrick, is always available to... Uh, answer your questions and don't hesitate to reach out. Um, fourth is the commissioner corner. This is the opportunity for commissioners if we don't see something on the agenda or if it doesn't fit appropriately within the agenda for commissioners to raise anything or uh, ask questions or say thanks uh, for any particular information we got. Anything folks want to talk about? Bob's in mid shoe. Uh, about lighting, I know we're not going to cover it tonight for good reason, but I just thought I would quickly state what I think the process is we're going through. Um, we follow certain recommendations about our lighting. We decided to revisit uh, that question. And the recommendation we follow more or less is from the IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society. They routinely, uh, over time, update their recommendations. So we're trying to find out what their latest recommendations are. They publish some, but others apparently um, are kind of pre-publicized in the cir circles before they are formally released, and we're trying to see if that's so. And then the third step would be, when we get that straight, uh, is there something going on in the field of lighting that might be coming up with new results, which would be a contradictory to whatever the IES comes up? So I see that as sort of a three-step process. Um, what do we do? What does IES finally say formally? And what else is happening out there? Just my suggestion for the process. Thank you. Um, and for viewers who might be new to this, uh, we went through a review probably in 2017 or so. It was or 2015. It was, well, it was two parts. Two yeah, part was review. 2017. And. Uh, since then, over the last year or so, uh, in particular, um, several streets have been um, updated uh, according to those standards. Uh, and we did hear from quite a few of um, Berlintonian residents saying, wow, is this, is this really what's needed? Do we really have to do this? It seems um, you know, exceedingly bright, uh, more so than what they personally think is necessary. On the other hand, we've also heard from folks who have expressed concern about not having enough light. Uh, so we have reached out, I think Andy has reached out uh, multiple times since maybe March. Um, I did call this morning uh, and left a message. Um, I would add one to, to the IES uh, to try and actually get some feedback so that we could actually find out what the updated standards may or may not be and if anything had changed. Um, I would just throw in one additional preamble step, um, Commissioner Herendine, which is that we were going to have a, sort of a, an overview um, so that, you know, I think uh, Bethany had not been part of our 2017 conversation and neither had Jim. Um, and so that all five commissioners could start the conversation at the same uh, level of understanding of what this, what the background was. 
Um, and we ended up, for a couple of reasons, number one, we didn't hear back from IES, but also we have a very full budget-focused meeting this time. We ended up saying, okay, let's postpone this for now. I guess the question to commissioners and staff is, does it make sense in the June meeting to go ahead and at least start off with the uh, primer, the overview, um, and to start the conversation regardless of what we hear back or not from IES since it's been so many months? Oh, I was going to suggest one here might want to weigh in. I think the, the update that Andy Elliston gave, or the, I guess, primer that he had given, um, I think if I want to say back in January, if, it, if that was the right meeting um, or February, it was somewhere in that time frame. Um, I think he had kind of given a, a bit of an overview of the current situation and some of the challenges. And then we were checking in with IES, as you mentioned, to try to see if we could get guidance relative to implementing the standards. Um, I don't have any objection uh, to revisiting in June if that's the right time. Um, I think Andy would probably benefit from knowing more specifically what the commission might be interested to hear about, because I think we've done a little bit of a general primer on the situation as we've understood it from some of the neighbors who have been concerned. Um, I think we did a broader discussion back in 2017, if I remember. Right. Um, I know uh, Paul certainly is engaged from a kind of a safety standpoint uh, with liability and, and with the city in terms of what our requirements are for lighting the streets. So. Uh, we could engage with Paul, Andy, others uh, to provide some sort of a just a basic overview, if that's what's most helpful, and go from there. Or if there's more specifics that the commission would like, we can we can prepare that. Well, I did have a comment that I sent to Andy, which was that if we get to anything like a decision, we've got to be up to date. And if folks are up to speed, and I appreciate why they might not be, um, but if they were, we'd probably get pretty quickly to the decision point. And so to go in without IES info mm -hmm. at that point would be kind of, uh, wouldn't be useful because we, we quickly uh, hit a wall. Uh, and then we didn't know what to do. We really know. The background, uh, I'll leave it up to the folks who weren't up to here in, back there in 2017. Okay, we'll, we'll make a note for the agenda for June mm -hmm. okay. to cover that topic more general. And then obviously if we have feedback from IES by that point, we'll, we'll share that. Um, I think it might also be helpful for the June meeting to cover what, what we're following now um, a little bit more in the details, not just at a general level, um, a little bit more like our 2017 conversation. Okay. Um, because that'll, that'll inform people for if and when we hear from IES. And at some point we should come up with a plan besides um, waiting for an entity that isn't responding. So, um, Bob, if it's okay, I know this is an area that you've studied for a long, long time. Uh, if you don't mind participating also in, in terms of, you know, what ultimately is presented in June, because you are steeped in this. Uh, and if you look at the presentation or if you chat with Andy and Munir about what might be most helpful for folks who may be first timers discussing this, that might be helpful. Okay. Look at me delegate. <laughs> Thank you. I'm using it. Okay. It's a mellow meeting so far. Other items from the commission? <laughs> okay. So next up, we have the general manager update. Uh, this is an oral update. Great. Well, it's nice to be here in person with everybody. Um, I had a few items uh, to highlight, one of which is, and we hope uh, the commissioners will share this. Uh, we have uh, new net zero yard signs that are uh, a few of us have put up at our, our homes and which we want to see around the community. Uh, folks can go to burlingtonelectric.com slash yard sign and uh, sign up for one. And we have customizable stickers. So if somebody has done any of the measures that we have a sticker for, we can put a sticker on the yard sign uh, saying something about the e-bikes or EVs or heat pumps. So it's sort of like we've taken a big step towards net zero, and then it tries to highlight the different measures that we have, uh, you know, taken at a particular home or or uh, property. Um, just part of an effort to try to make this, uh, you know, more community engagement in terms of the net zero goal, the uh, the achievements, the you know, taking uh, taking different types of initiatives, um, and then uh, we're also we've been I think experimenting with different communication strategies. Uh, with our customers. I know we've talked about, we've done radio ads, digital ads. Um, one thing that we're also trying to focus on is 
using the bills, which is a great, obviously, communication opportunity with customers. Uh, so we had a bill insert that went in uh, this past month's bill uh, talking about water heaters. And if you have an older water heater, maybe consider looking at renewable options like a heat pump water heater and maybe don't wait till it breaks because at that point, if you're trying to switch from fossil fuel to a heat pump water heater, there's going to be an electrician that's going to have to come out, maybe do something with your panel, and uh, it may not be very feasible to do. So we tried to target folks who might have a water heater 10 years old or older who might be starting to think about a replacement, let them know about our incentives. Um, we're going to have further communications coming uh, as a bill insert, I think, in the June uh, bills, which will cover some of the items we'll talk about tonight in terms of the rates and the energy assistance, but also highlight our e-mower program, our e-bike program, and our EV program. So we're looking to proactively communicate. We certainly appreciate any efforts the commission can make uh, in terms of amplifying those messages, front porch forum posts in your neighborhoods, um, et cetera, to let folks know about the incentives, the yard signs, the different things that we're doing, because uh, we want to get the word out. Um, second item, uh, the thermal charter change has been signed, uh, which was great. and. <clears throat> we had a uh, resolution that came forward. Uh, we worked on with the mayor and city council, uh, which was passed unanimously earlier this month, that basically lays out what the work is going to be for Burlington Electric going forward with the charter change. So we have a few categories that we're going to explore. Um, new construction, major renovations, um, city buildings, and then large existing commercial buildings. Um, so I want to be crystal clear because this has been a point of discussion um, we are not, with the thermal charter change, looking at existing residential or existing small businesses uh, for application of that authority. We're really looking at those other categories of buildings. And uh, we're going to report back to the City Council uh, July 18th uh, will be our initial report back. And then we're going to have work that will flow from that uh, further. And we're partnering with the Permitting and Inspections Department on this work. Uh, the Building Electrification Institute nationally, which looks at best practices around the country. And we're going to try to come up with some thoughtful policy options for those different buildings to help us accelerate uh, adoption of renewable technology, reduce fossil fuel use uh, through policy, because incentives are part of the uh, effort. Policy is part of the effort as well. Um, another item I'm particularly excited about, we had a great meeting, uh, myself, Emily, Mike Kanarek, who's on uh, Teams, with the Trusted Community Voices Program in the city, uh, which is a group that meets uh, with leaders from uh, refugee and immigrant community who are uh, helping in Burlington to give us feedback on our programs. Uh, we discussed issues around language translation uh, for customer incentives and programs, uh, how we could do a better job in terms of outreach to our diverse community. Uh, we've got some great follow-up uh, takeaways from that meeting. Uh, CEDO, our, our Colleagues at CEDO uh, helped to facilitate those meetings. And I think there are really great opportunities there to expand our outreach efforts in Burlington um, around some of our different programs and also to take uh, feedback on how we're designing our programs uh, from that group. So uh, hoping to have more engagement with the Trusted Community Voices program going forward. Um, question, uh, Scott. Yeah, actually, um, so over at um, where I work, we have um, the Vermont Language Justice Center. Mm -hmm just sort of came in under us. Same building? Same, same office. Oh, okay. Um, so they're translating um, COVID stuff, uh, uh, ballots, th those sorts of things. Um, and I'm wondering if there might be a, 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 a synergy there yeah, with if, Allison. If you have a contact. Would yeah, Allison right. Seeger, she's right, right, right on our site. She, you can Perfect. see one of our staff members, so it's a, I want to say it's a government funded thing, grant, grant funded thing, but we're finding that uh, it, it's starting to blow up. People are wanting uh, that service. Because we're really interested, <clears throat> whether it's customer surveys, certain website information, other documents that we want to make sure translated. And, and then uh, we had a good discussion around that, you know, in some cases, uh, there may be a literacy challenge in addition to a translation challenge. And so in some cases, we need members of the community who can share the information in different ways uh, as well. But that'd be great. Love to follow up. Thank you. Um, I had an item here on federal funding. I can report an update that we were not successful on the partnership with CEDO for the battery storage project at Elmwood Avenue, uh, the temporary uh, shelter site. I am looking into one other option there that might be relevant for us to be able to help deploy battery storage 
uh, for that site. It won't be with federal funding, but I'm looking into another option. So hopefully we'll be able to make something happen there where we can have uh, battery storage, BED can utilize it for peak reduction during peak events, and it's available for the temporary shelter site to ensure that there's always power. We're, we're pretty reliable in terms of our service, but uh, it's important that there be power there 24 seven. So we're partnering with the city on that. And then uh, lastly, um, and uh, was just over there today, Paul Pickna and, and Emily and others. Um, we've been doing a lot of tours at McNeil and Winooski One. Um, we've had uh, several city councilors, members of the legislature uh, coming through. I think there's really just no substitute for folks visiting uh, the plant uh, and visiting Winooski One and visiting McNeil, learning about sustainability, learning about the operations, how it works. Um, I think it demystifies things a little bit. And I hear persistent things sometimes uh, in the community or on social media. And uh, sometimes people think, for example, that the uh, plume that comes out of the cooling tower, uh, which is steam, is somehow a pollution plume. And so we can we can talk about that when somebody is at the plant. Um, uh, interesting just to kind of take feedback from those tours and learn what people found uh, exciting and interesting. And given that there continues to be a broader conversation around biomass, particularly at the state level, I think it's helpful for folks to be able to visit the plant uh, and learn about how we operate, why it's sustainable, and why we believe it's a appropriate part of the renewable portfolio for uh, for the community. So uh, a lot of appreciation, uh, particularly to uh, Paul, Rodney, Betsy, and McNeil, and Dave McDonnell, who have all done tours with us over the last few months, and John Clark at Winooski One. Uh, those have been excellent uh, opportunities for us to engage, and we hope to do more of that in the future. And that is the update. Any questions? Since you were out at Winooski One, there's something in our text about managing for fishing. Could you? Managing for fish? Well, you know, fishing, I think the term was. Oh. Uh, uh, at Winooski One? So. Um, was that in the, uh, oh, in the, in the report here? Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, I just wonder what it is. Yeah, and Paul can yeah. jump in on this. Oh, okay. okay, that that I understand. I, I thought you were starting to change this flow. That was one of the things actually on one of the tours that somebody mentioned was learning about the fish ladder and how John Clark works with the state fish and wildlife and that they're able to track which fish are coming in and uh, in some cases, he's able to take them further up river where they have a better environment to, you know, th that's stuff that I don't think people know generally about, about the facility. It is it's very interesting and, and yeah, they do great work. Thank you. Uh, and thanks also for the full team write up as well. Um, Really good to see just the, the stats go up on, I mean, granted, it's not as many as we need, but on heat pumps and heat pump water heaters and the strategic dashboard. Um, so next up, we have the beginning of the meat of the meeting, financials. This is fiscal year 2022, March. This is a discussion with Emily. Uh, and this is like the Emily Byrne show. <laughs> no, this is the second episode of the Emily Byrne show. Last <laughs> um, but nice to see you all in person. Nice, nice to see you. Yes, yeah. very much. Yeah. Um, so I will share my screen. I can find. I have too many things open. There we go. Um, first I will, one thing I wanted to quickly touch on before diving fully into the financials was the accounts receivable detail. This is nor, this is in the, in the packet, um, just to sort of flag this chart that we applied the ARPA funds in April. So you see the arrearages dropping off, um, for residential customers. And then we did an application of funding for commercial customers in May. Um, and just that, I think 
wanted to flag that we will probably retire showing this graph now that we've sort of applied the arrearages that um, disconnects are back or will be occurring again so that this will be, um, we'll probably wait till the end of the fiscal year, but then this will go away. Um, but anyway, just wanted to flag that. So we'll dive right into the financials. Um, so March was another good month for us. Um, net income for the month was 397,000 as compared to a budget of 886. So 471,000 better than budget, or I should rephrase that. Net income was a negative 397,000, which was better than a negative net, um, budgeted 886,000 um, by $471,000. Um, so year to date, we're $1.4 million ahead of budget. On the revenue side, sales to customers is up $115,000. Um, primarily that is residential at about 103,000 and the balance is the commercial is up. Other net revenues were down $61,000 primarily driven by the EEU. Um, and February is not a rec month. So there's no rec revenue in or Feb March, excuse me. got to figure out what year, what month I'm talking about. Um, so then I'm moving on to the expense side, also very favorable. Um, energy prices are still up. That's the primary driver between behind the um, favorable results in the power supply budget. Um, there was production was below budget for the month and wood chip costs were higher for the month, primarily driven by diesel prices. But because the energy prices were so good, they made up for both of those um, unfavorable directions on the power supply side. Additionally, the gas turbine was called on to run on March 29th with a net benefit to BED due to the higher energy prices. Transmission costs um, were under budget as well as wind and Winooski one um, production was over budget. The operating expenses were down or were to the good of $74,000, primarily driven by labor and labor overhead um, and outside services being below budget. Um, taxes are down for the same same explanation as every month due to the pilot change that happened um, at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, and other income was down this month due to contribution, customer contributions being lower than budget. The, the wind rec revenue, is that more um, a symptom of the market or is that more a symptom of, of how much was actually generated? I believe it's production, right? Yeah. It's, it's not market. Yep. Um, so that's the summary for the month. So for the year, sales to customers um, are ahead by $136,000. Last month, we were about right on budget. Um, residential is still up compared to budget. and Non-residentials um, are down compared to budget. Um, we're s below budget on other revenues um, due to customer billings in the EU. Um, and we're under on power supply by 49,000 as the result of the rec production that we just touched on. Power supply year to date is ahead of budget by 1.86 million, which is about 8% below budget. Purchase power costs are down, transmissions down, and fuel costs are down total for the year. Um, our operating expenses are also below budget by 1.27 million. Um, not much of a change from last month. That's about 8.5% below budget. Similarly, variety of things, labor, um, outside services, materials are all under budget. Um, and our other income for the year is down, um, same as we talked about in prior months, the ARPA assumptions and customer contributions that have not come in um, that were assumed in the budget. Are there any questions on the income statement for the month or year to date? No, just anything in particular you're mindful of or concerned about? Not, I mean, I think we're doing great so far. Like, yeah. it's a good year so far. I think, um, I think the Rex is definitely, yeah, helpful. Yeah, yeah, high energy prices are definitely to our favor. So, I guess you know, one thing I just mentioned is the power supply variance being the 1.8 million. <clears throat> and really driving uh, quite a bit of the favorable uh, variance year to date. Um, as we talk about the FY23 budget, uh, this type of performance is a bit more baked into the FY23 budget. Um, so we are looking at the energy forwards for FY23 being high or, or higher than what they were in FY22, which were higher than what we had projected. 
Um, so that's just, it's a, a key point, I think, for as we think about the FY23 budget is um, having these higher power supply uh, energy market options when we're running at high price times in the winter, particularly when McNeil's strong production and we're net long and we're able to sell excess power for the benefit of our customers is an assumption that's baked in more in the FY23 budget than it was in this budget. So it's a good thing for us, but I just wanted to be clear about that. Can I add a quick comment on that? Oh. Where did, where James. did James come from? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just wow, a quick so comment, which is that the, the forwards, the, the prices for the coming winter, when we did the budget last year, were very low, as Darren says. They were about six and a half cents for winter power. Right now, they're around 21 cents for winter power. So, you know, now that we actually are seeing that, it's not really forecasted, now that we're seeing that forward market do that, we can reflect in the budget. Last year, there was no visibility to that happening. The actual prices this last winter came in around 16 cents to 14 cents a kilowatt hour during January and February. And I, I suspect we'll touch on this a little bit when we're talking about next year's budget, but it'll be helpful, I think, for viewers to have a sense of why we feel comfortable assuming that those prices will remain higher. Uh, yeah, I think we should touch on it when we get there, certainly. Okay. All right. All right. We'll move on to capital spending. Um, so year to date, we're about 43 percent of the way through our capital budget. Um, a lot of this is just due to timing of projects. The McNeil um, overhaul occurred in April, so that will consume a um, significant chunk of our remaining capital to date. Um, and if you recall that we talked about in prior months, there, um, there are a couple things that aren't going to happen this year that were initially built into the budget, um, including um, a purchase of equity. Velcro equity, there we go, um, of $1.15 million. There was there are some IT forward projects that aren't going to occur until FY23, and the electric bucket truck um, probably won't come, is not going to come in this fiscal year or not next fiscal year either. Um, uh, uh, yep. <laughs> that would be cool. That's supply related? Yes. Yeah. We want it. The vendor... Uh, has a delay, and and I think we have um, two other utilities in Vermont that are going to get the same uh, vehicle and have a grant as well. So we're anticipating it in the summer of twenty three, I believe, but that'll be fiscal twenty four. So, right. yeah, we were hoping to have it sooner. And real quick, our cash at the end of March was ten point six nine million. At the end of February, we were at eleven point nine. Um, credit rating factors are good um, compared to last month. That service covered ratio is up to 5.47 um, from 5.26 last month. Adjusted debt service coverage is at 1.5, up from 1.43 last month. And our day's cash on hand is 138, which is slightly lower from where we were last month at 145. But all in all, we're in a good, good position coming the end of March. Thanks. Great. All right, what's act two is the budget, right? Yes, so. Do you want me to share it, Dan? I have, um, I have it open. So next up uh, is. Well, if you have, do you have the current? Sorry. That's okay. What Lori sent everyone. Okay. Uh, if you no, if you want to drive it, that's great. You've already got it up there. <laughs> so next up is um, the. Fiscal year 2023 updated draft budget. This is a discussion and a vote. And I think we're going to, if it's okay, um, well, how would the commission like to proceed? We have slides on the budget and the rate proposal. Would you like those all together or would you like us to do the budget first and then pause? They're obviously intertwined. But they're two different decision points, right? Correct. Pause. Pause. Okay. So we'll run through slides, I think through seven and then we'll take a pause. Um, great. Okay. Slide one. Um, so just going into FY23, uh, no surprise to the commission. And Emily, I don't you want to join too at the table here. Um, no surprise to the commission or anybody listening. Uh, high inflation environment. Uh, you know, last several 
reports above 8%. We're certainly seeing that in um, our supply chain. And uh, in addition to you know high inflation, we've talked about the energy forwards or, or unprecedented levels. That's potentially a positive for us in that we're you know long on power. We're able to sell and benefit from that. But uh, there are other kind of pieces of volatility for us, uh, you know, wood procurement, uh, which does have a component related to diesel fuel. Uh, diesel is incredibly expensive right now. It's even more expensive on the East Coast, and it's diverged from gas pricing uh, pretty significantly. Um, so where you might see 450 at the pump on gas, we're seeing north of 650 on diesel. Um, so that's obviously as an input for wood procurement, that's going to all things equal drive the price of wood higher. Um, so we're, we're grappling with those pieces. Uh, FY22, we had the 7.5% rate change. Um, we had at the PUC a demonstrated need of 11.8 last year. So if we had gone just for everything we needed last year, we would have asked for the 11.8. Uh, we asked for 7.5. So we knew there would be a piece, uh, even, if, even if there were no other upward pressure, there would be a piece that we would have to come back for this year to make that whole. Um, we have a IBEW contract expiring at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, so we'll have some new uh, pieces related to that as we go forward. Um, good cash position. We have the strong McNeil production. That's a benefit to us. We're going to start FY23 in a better position than I think we thought we would uh, when we were planning the FY22 budget. So that's a positive. Uh, the net zero revenue bond is a positive. Um, if we were trying to design this budget, without the bond and do everything we were talking about doing here, you would be seeing a double digit rate request, which is something we're able to avoid uh, thanks to the financing and capital from the bond. So uh, I want customers to know, I want the commission to know that continues to be a key source of capital, a key driver of keeping rates reasonable in the near term and, and continues to be a good decision, I think, uh, for us and for the community. And uh, we saw just a moment ago, great uh, metrics in terms of our credit rating key metrics. A 1.5 on ADSCR uh, is something we haven't seen in this meeting, I think, since probably 2018 or 2017. So um, that's a great metric. I don't know that it'll stay quite at that elevated level through the duration of FY22. It's not my expectation that it will, but I believe we'll end the year higher than we projected. And we're in a position to, uh, with our rate request as well, uh, have a continued improvement in that metric and keeping our day's cash on hand metric above the A rating as well. So we're always focused on those metrics. I think we've seen vast improvement in 22 and we've designed the 23 budget to build on that. Great, so I'll jump in with some of our key assumptions and a high level overview of the budget. So we're assuming operating revenues of 63.6 .6 million, which is about 5% higher than the FY21 budget. Let's say FY22. It should be up higher than FY22. Sorry, I just got that. <laughs> um, there, it does include the rate increase of 3.95 that we'll discuss later, effective August 1st, in response to inflation and the other uncontrollable cost increases that the company's facing. Um, there is assumed increased kilowatt our sales um, to customers as the sort of effects of COVID-19, we assume, start to um, go away over time. Um, and we've also included increased rec sales. Um, operating expenses are at 64.5 million, but 1% higher than the 22 budget. And one of the, bi the big cost pressures um, within there include the wood fuel costs, as Darren alluded to, the sort of um, increased diesel prices that suppliers are facing um, result in an increased cost there. Um, our transmission costs are up uh, nearly $900,000. Um, purchase power, and James may want to jump in, but is um, lower by $2.6 million, and that's really due to the anticipated high energy forwards. So we've been receiving additional funds as a result of the current high energy prices, and we anticipate based on the futures markets for that to continue into the next year's budget. So we've built that in um, to the FY23 budget. There is an increase of $134,000 to the city indirect allocation. So the costs um, allocated to us by the city are going up. Um, we've also included 
um, an additional FTE, a sort of project manager and business analyst, um, but we're funding that by re reallocating contractual services that are currently in the budget to fund that. Our interest expense is about 30% higher than it was in the FY22 budget. That's due to the net zero energy um, revenue bond that we adopted. And so the result of all of that is a net income of about 1.23 million, which is about $424,000 higher than the FY22 budget. We passed last year. I'll pause there if there's any questions or if anyone else has anything to add. I asked a while ago <coughs> what fraction of our budget was debt service, and it's kicked up. Has it got a number for that? Rough as a percentage? Not off the top of my head. We'll work on it during the meeting and then return, yes. return to it. <laughs> no. All right. Um, so to keep going sort of over that high level overview, um, this also includes the energy assistance pilot rate that's been talked about at previous meetings. Um, we're seeking approval of the of 18 month pilot rate for low income customers to offer them a discount of 12.5% um, for FY23. We will fund that um, using the remaining ARPA funds that we have after the applications to cover arrearages that were outstanding. So our Moody's metrics for the FY23 budget, our debt service coverage ratio, we 3.91 with an adjusted debt service coverage of 1.26 and anticipated days cash on hand um, of 104 days. No we'll pause there for questions. Uh, I know we talked about this last month, but um, remind me what our estimation was in terms of likely uptake of the uh, energy assistance. I think we had budgeted based on an assumption, James can correct me if I'm wrong, of uh, somewhere between like 800 to 1500 customers participating. Uh, which was based on participation rates we saw from GMP and BGS, yeah. not on our current participation rate with the Energy Assistance Program, which has been low and climbing sort of steadily. That was somewhere north of like 100K or so? I'm correct. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Um, so this is probably a familiar slide. I know it's been in presentations in prior years, um, but just demonstrating that we've sort of kept um, controllable costs down um, as to where they were projected to be. If you sort of use FY16 as the baseline um, with average growth. And the bulk of that is... How much would you say that's like the inflation compared to? This slide may be less relevant in future years. I think we've, we've kept it as sort of a, it was originally put in, I think, to reflect the reorganization that happened uh, when Neil was general manager and we had okay. uh, a buyout and we had a kind of flattening of some of the cost structure that was built in. Yep. And so we, we had compared this period prior to FY16 with the period after, and there certainly is a, a delta that's reasonable in terms of how we managed uh, controllable costs. But I think, and we, we kind of have this parenthetical in here, um, I think the period of 07 to 16, uh, the inflation during that period of time is not really comparable to the inflation that we're seeing now. So this may just be a less relevant or, or less useful comparison uh, as we go forward than it was in the past. Well, and also if I recall with the restructuring, it was mostly estimated to have like a financial benefit of like two to four years, I want to say three. But right, and so we, we've we've certainly not about that. We've not grown at the pace that we were growing at that point on this particular metric, but I think it'd be fair to say that that's sort of now baked in, and um, we we might not present this slide next year. Perhaps is that that was your take? I would recommend. Yeah, I think we all agree on that. I think James made a point about it as well, so it may have served its purpose. 
on to um, capital spending. So we've got about a $9.1 million um, anticipated capital investment. Equates to about 11% of net utility plant and service. It includes the $3 million general bond, um, general obligation bond, and 5.7 from the revenue bond. The, the balance of that is, you know, cash spending. Um, included in that <coughs> capital spending are additional EV chargers, um, a new electric fleet vehicles, um, purchasing some extra. This, I keep flipping this. Belco, Belco Equity, I'll get there, um, and additional distribution and IT system upgrades and general plant maintenance. Looks like the bulk of the increase is in distribution. That's partly revenue bond projects. Okay. Making and, and transmission is gone, going down that much? Yeah, that's the well, equity investment. Yeah. It's not the it's not the transmission expense. It's the right. equity investment in Velco. From getting it from Velco, okay. Yeah, right. Which is based on the equity calls that Velco chooses to issue and their own debt to equity ratio and, and financing structure. Yeah. Right. Okay. So like that just right. Okay. Great. So wrap this wraps up the budget piece. Um, Obviously important for us to continue with all of the various net zero initiatives. Um, I won't touch on all of these, but uh, I do wanna note that we do have in the budget the plan to double funding that's available for customer incentives for electrification, which was part of the revenue bond proposal. Um, so that's included uh, continued you know, strong incentives across all of our different categories. Um, we have uh, funding for two other vacant positions that we hadn't filled during the pandemic that we're hoping to repurpose and fill in the energy services and sustainability areas to add to our staff capacity uh, for net zero. Um, we will have, uh, we've actually, I believe we've ordered the level three charger uh, first in the city for uh, replacing the current one here at 585 Pine. And we are exploring an option uh, at a lower KW rating for the marketplace garage uh, which would use the existing infrastructure and add a new level three there as well. We'll continue to try to roll out additional level three chargers as well as level twos. Um, we mentioned, or Emily mentioned the two fleet EVs. Um, we're looking at uh, maybe a truck if Paul can find one and Jeff, uh, but certainly if not, potentially electric SUVs. Um, we'd really like to have an electric truck in our fleet in the near future. Uh, it's important for us to model new technologies and, and adopt new technologies. And there's certainly some compelling electric vehicle truck options that are now being offered. Well, they're tough to get, but um, I wanted to mention too that uh, one initiative that really came to us from our line crew uh, was replacing their their gas chainsaws and pulse saws with electric. Uh, so we're, we're uh, Munir, we funded half of that this year and half next year. So we'll be fully electric on the uh, chainsaws and pulse saws. We're, okay. we're, we're pleased with that. and. Um, the converting the GT to biodiesel, we're gonna start that work uh, in FY23. And uh, the community ambassador program there is something in Emily's area that is going to potentially uh, help us to further our outreach, uh, you know, kind of similar to the Trusted Community Voices program to have folks that we're engaging with uh, who can help us with outreach to uh, different parts of the Burlington community. So that's a new initiative for us as well. That's uh, part of the budget. So. We can pause there. Uh, the next piece of this is related to the rate change proposal. Uh, uh, technology. Quick. Sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> Sorry, are we uh, going to recognize our, our ACE financial analyst, Cheryl Mitchell, who's here uh, and who has provided the answer to your question, Commissioner Heron Dean. Um, debt service principal and interest are 12% of our total use of cash, so total use of funds. Um, how technologically challenging is it to convert the gas turbine to biodiesel? Paul Pickness says it's very easy. <laughs> right, Paul? Uh, sarcasm I'm there. Hearing I'm hearing some sarcasm. Do you want to come up for a moment? <laughs> um. So we are actively seeking a partner to help 
with the biodiesel conversion. Uh, we're thinking of a stepped approach preliminarily. Pre preliminarily, uh, our Title V permit allows to, for up to B20 um, conversion under the current permit. Um, we're hopeful that we can get some sort of conversion done um, relatively rapidly without a tremendous amount of engineering and uh, capital expenditures required for upgrades. And then uh, time that with a Title V permit renewal that is up anyway to go up to a B100 conversion. Um, I do want to note that this is, um, you know, the planning is in its infancy. infancy. Um, there's two entities that we have partnered with in the past that um, have not been able to give us proposals and timelines to date. Um, so there may be some struggles, but I do think the general plan is sound uh, and hopefully we can we can pull it off. So some sort of B5 to B20 conversion stepped up to B100 in the, in the next couple of years, the following year. Oh, sorry, percent of uh, percent of um, biodiesel. So B20 would be 20%. Yeah. And then um, what's the you know, cost benefit of biodiesel in reality? Like, you know, it generates a bunch of money for just having it from ISO New England. And so can you, from a cost benefit? Potentially we could gain exposure in a rec market um, if it's renewable. Um, and then just adding to our 100% renewable portfolio. Um, you know, I think there's some value added there. Certainly meets our emissions and values and goals as an organization. Um, Does the price of biodiesel converge with diesel more or less? You know, in the current climate, I'm not sure. Everything's... We have a voice from above. Yeah. <laughs> James might have an answer. Yeah. Well, it, it probably is, but I don't know if that's permanent. At the end of the day, we don't really operate that for energy. So the cost of fuel isn't that critical a component. You know, it's really the, the capital cost and the business case around the capital cost is what I think we need to be focused on more than the energy price. And I was thinking a little bit about, uh, you know, if you um, upgrade your furnace or whatnot, you end up having to, uh, you know, take into consideration certain technical factors like whether or not your basement gets too cold to go up to B100 or, you know, the viscosity and all that. Absolutely. Is that is yeah. that also a similar issue, concern? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. We are so are we going to thermally wrap the gas turbine? <laughs> well, we're at an advantage because our fuel oil tank is indoors. So okay. we're at a huge advantage there. Um, one potential struggle that we're going to be faced with for a, uh, a step... <laughs> say B20 conversion is uh, tank agitation may be required. So that could add to the costs and that could hurt the cost benefit analysis, but um, we're just not there yet to, to fully understand if that's required. Uh, but I assure you, we are, we are trying. You can't just shake it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that's funny, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, 100,000 gallons. I know. <laughs> Giant stir. <laughs> Commissioner? So uh, I know the answer to this, but anyway, uh, when I hear biodiesel in general, I do wonder about supply, and I haven't done the numbers, which I should. On the other hand, this is a small use. So I guess when you say you're not worried about the price, too much. Uh, that's based not only on thinking about your own use, which probably doesn't affect it very much, but what's out there in the world regarding the biodiesel uh, future. Yeah, so, uh, so. yeah, purchasing has helped us out with uh, supply chain considerations. Um, you know, we're, we're tentatively being told that supply may not be an issue. Um, and having that said, in an ideal world, let's just say there's 48 hours, you know, it's a system emergency, 48 hours until biodiesel truck's gonna show up. In ideal world, we can still burn diesel fuel um, in that case. Obviously, there's an impact to reporting, but, um, you know, the, the goal would be we wouldn't lose full functionality of diesel um, as a fuel, um, you know, if we could pull that off from an engineering perspective. Well, also, yeah, my, 
was really more to the point that the, the unit's primary revenue streams are from the board capacity market and full reserve market. Neither of those markets require material amounts of operation for energy. And to the extent that it does run for energy, it's usually at very, very high price times. So what we would do is the, the cost of biodiesel would be factored into the bid price that would effectively start the unit a little later than it currently starts today at all in terms of market prices. But we won't lose money on it because it wouldn't run at a time where the, where the cost of biodiesel was uneconomical. Right. It's mostly on standby. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. Sorry, that was a digression, but it's unusual to see that proposal. So thanks for your work on it. I don't imagine it'll be easy. I don't think it will be, but <laughs> we're aspiring to get it done. Thanks. thanks. So we had just gotten to the end of the budget presentation. Do folks have questions about it? I, we should not be voting on the budget um, without having the rate um, discussion because the two are well, Yeah, I was going to say, what, 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 what were you going to say about rates that sort of connects with this before we get to or, 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 yeah, or we're, a, a bridge that connects them? Or, happy to go through the rate yeah. slides if that's helpful that. now. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, I do have a question which may or may not uh, <clears throat> work right here. Uh, when I was looking at the residential uh, electricity use for the last several months, uh, it turned out that uh, compared to the budget, more was used, whether it was colder than average or warmer than average. And then I said, okay, that's just pandemic noise. Uh, so first question, is it pandemic noise? And the second question is, if so, is pandemic noise duly handled in the budget Different or post pandemic. post pandemic noise hopefully I, I would say the answer to both of those questions is yes right and that's i mean but this is our speculation but just speculation based on observation of sales to customers throughout the pandemic generally speaking most months residential use has been higher than we had would have previously forecast without a pandemic and commercial most of the time has been below what we had budgeted or predicted most of the time. But now more than two years into this event, um, who knows what life will bring, right? But we're here in our first hybrid meeting, for example. Um, it, it sort of is appearing to us based on sales that um, more people being home more of the time than before the pandemic is a reasonable assumption. Um, and, and as you saw in Emily's presentation, there was a note that kilowatt hour sales in the budget are projected to be up a little bit um, because of what we think is gonna be a long-term effect, or at least an effect for the next 12 months of that trend continuing, where residential use will be higher, you know, but not by huge amounts, but higher than we were would have been predicting in our in our you know prior pre-pandemic load forecasting models. And the commercial side, I'm guessing a slow increase over time. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But yeah. not um, a full. I mean, we keep waiting, and it's just a bit, it seems to be a slow, like that's right opening. Yep. Yeah. You want to drive? You want me to drive? I want you to drive. Man. Great. You're driving. You're just, you're the boss. Oh. <laughs> I've lost my thread. <laughs> okay. This is a slide we had last year. Um, oh, well, yeah, we'll start with the headline. <laughs> We're proposing a 3.95% rate change. Um, we had talked, I think, last meeting about a 4.9%. Part of the reason we're able to lower it to 3.95 is based on those updated energy forwards. So uh, that is, if there was a risk, a prime risk in this budget, it would be one of two things. Either we had, um, let's say McNeil offline for a significant period of time during the upcoming winter for reasons that are out of our control, uh, which is a risk generally, but it's a heightened risk in this price environment. Um, or secondly, that uh, we had such a mild winter that the high energy forwards did not materialize. Um, I think all the other dynamics that are causing those prices to go up are gonna be in effect 
and likely to continue to be in effect during the winter. So I think the, the prime risks would be one of those two things happening. Um, even in a normal winter, if McNeil wasn't running at normal capacity during the winter, you'd see an impact. It'll just be heightened in this budget if that happens. Um, so that's the risk. The benefit is uh, if, if things go as we project, the 3.95% gets you uh, the Moody's metrics that you saw, the 1.23 million net income that you saw, and uh, does so at a lower ask of our customers than what we were projecting to need uh, last month. And I think in, in this inflation environment, 3.95 is, is a pretty good uh, you know, uh, rate increase. And certainly as we think about things like folks who are driving electric compared to people who are paying at the gas pump, uh, the volatility at the gas pump is extreme. And uh, prices uh, for other commodities such as natural gas are increasing pretty dramatically. So we have a relatively stable uh, cost structure here that I think benefits our customers overall. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, to your point about if we have a mild winter, uh, so, you know, a, a net income of 1.23 million isn't a huge cushion. Um, uh, asking the voice from above, which James, you would love to know what it's like. Um, <laughs> uh, wondering um, if you look back over like the last 10 years of a, of a mild winter, you know, what, what that looks like. It, it would it could be a fairly significant impact on the budget not not well well above six figures um, but there's not much we can do about that where you know there's a constraint too on what we can ask for in rates we're not allowed to put in whatever we want for, for energy assumptions in rates either so we're kind of hamstrung we're still exploring a potential transaction that would reduce some of that risk if we can um, but you know what does a mild winter look like if the disruption in the Ukraine is still going on? What does a mild winter look like if it's not? Um, what does it look like if the disruption in the Ukraine is still going on and it's not a mild winter? That's that's actually an ugly scenario that's worse than we've seen it, or well, worse for other people, better for us because again we have excess renewable energy. But I just, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, just for for context, I think last winter where we saw a significant benefit was not a particularly cold well, winter. It wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. And we still saw that benefit. One month. Right. It was it January. was very slightly warmer than normal winter and we saw record prices. That's why I'm saying if there's any disruptions on top of that in the winter is normal or colder than normal, you know, it could get seriously expensive. But again, as long as McNeil is online and our other resources are performing reasonably, we have excess energy. Yeah, I think the key uh, for perhaps uh, viewers who might be thinking about this is the fact that, to your point, we can't just go in and say, we think we should have a higher rate increase because of this risk. Um, so it's threading this needle. That's right. That's right. And obviously, all things equal, we're always happy to hold the rate increase lower, um, but we're doing so based on what we know about current markets. So it's it's based in reason. Um Hypothetically, if uh, you know it was a mild winter, if gas prices were lower, wrecks were lower, et cetera, um, have there been areas in the budget that you've looked at that you could say this could be postponed for a year? Or I mean, we would go through, if it was a significant variance, not just a mild variance, but a significant variance, um, we would likely mid-year go through the type of exercise we went through during the pandemic where we adjusted our expenditures, we postpone certain expenditures, and we do everything we could within reason to keep expenses low. Um, we might not be able to mitigate the entirety of the impact, um, but we would do everything we could to, to try. Okay. Okay, back to, I think we go to the second slide on there. Um, so this was something we presented last year. This is just the timeline of our rate changes, um, and obviously, um, we have uh, a second rate change now in 22 after 21. I think it's my expectation and our team's expectation that we will have rate changes regularly, like we've talked about. But our goal and our commitment is, is that we're trying to make them more moderate than what we saw with the 2021 7.5%. I think we've, we've done that this year. I'd love to get to a point where we're even more moderate than what we're proposing this year. Um, but certainly, we'll, we'll always try to look at things like inflation and other you know, metrics as a way to judge whether we're um, keeping costs low or whether costs are too high. Um, 
I think uh, next slide is kind of to that point. Um, this is only through February. Um, I would note this does not include gasoline prices, for example, or they might be kind of moving off the chart a little bit. But uh, if you compare our rates at the bottom in the dark green uh, to things like housing, like medical care, like inflation, vehicle prices, uh, you can see the increases. And some of those increases would be even higher if we were showing them through March, April, or May. Um, but we've been able to hold our rate trajectory uh, well below uh, the rate of inflation over the period of time that's uh, you know, represented in this uh, graph, which is, I think, a 12-year period of time. Um, so I think we, we continue to have kind of a good value proposition relative to some of these uh, other cost metrics that we look at. Show admission like going to the movies? Yes. I remember with our team, we put that together last year. I think it was, yeah, the price of going to a movie uh, or a For the live Flynn. event. Um, Interesting. So residential rates, uh, we have here on the top two lines a projection. Uh, these are not actuals for New England and other Vermont utilities. Uh, those trajectories could actually be higher when we start to look at actuals. So those are just projections. Um, but as you can see, um, the dark green we continue to be well below the state average and the New England average in terms of residential customers. What you see with the blue line that diverges uh, is our uh, energy assistance program rate. And so we can, we'll can we talk about that a little bit more, but with the new energy assistance program being a 12.5% discount, even when you factor in the seven and a half and the 3.95, uh, those customers who are participating in that program, all things equal are gonna see a lower cost now, when they start that rate in uh, uh, July, it'll be July, the 12.5% discount than they would have before our most recent rate increases. So we're providing hopefully some material assistance for our low-income customers who are participating in that program. Um, so on this slide, again, I have to make the caveat that the other New England utilities and the Vermont utilities lines are projections. Those could actually be higher, um, but in terms of commercial industrial, uh, this would show us being a little higher than the Vermont average, lower than the New England average. Um, so we'll have to see what that looks like when we see other utility uh, rates actually come in, and we can certainly update that. Um, and then on the next slide, total rates, we continue to be lower than the Vermont and New England averages on total rates, um, which is a, just a helpful metric. Um, I think on the next slide, uh, just another representation of each of those in terms of where we are currently in blue, where we are proposed after the 3.95% in dark green. Uh, you can see we're lower on the residential side than any of the other state averages, including the Vermont average. Uh, and on commercial industrial, uh, we're a little closer to mid-tier um, in terms of total rates. Uh, we're still in kind of the bottom third, uh, even after the proposed increase. Uh, so question that we always want to get to, uh, I know, is what is the actual impact for customers on their bills? Uh, for a residential customer, the proposed increase would be about a $3.10 increase for an average residential bill. Uh, for small general, which I believe represents uh, roughly uh, a little more than two thirds of our, of our commercial customers, uh, the increase would be about three fifty dollars on an average bill. And then I think we have one more slide. So this is going to that point about the energy assistance program. Um, if you took both of our recent, our, our 7.5% and our 3.95 that's proposed, both of those rate changes, um, that added uh, about $8.95 to customer bills for low-income customers who would be participating in the energy assistance program. The bill credit starting in July would be uh, $10.65. So they're actually going to be saving a little bit relative to the bill impact from the rate changes. Um, the program, which you've already approved and the city council's already approved and is going to the PUC for approval. Uh, and there we have it, 800 to 1500 residential customers are, uh, that's what we based our assumptions on as, as I mentioned earlier. And 185% uh, of federal poverty continues to be the metric that we're using for participation. So uh, that's obviously a critical program for us, for our low income customers. We're gonna do everything we can to help uh, increase the participation rate from where it's been. And I believe that was our last rate slide. And what's the 
process of, you know, when we fi filing to um, actually have, and I know we can we can actually implement it before it gets. What's that? What's that time? Correct. So we're we're anticipating something very similar to last year, where uh, if you all advance it this evening, uh, we will discuss it at the board of finance tomorrow at our budget presentation there. Uh, the board of finance and city council would review and vote on it on June sixth at their meeting on June sixth. We would uh, file with the PUC mid June. Uh, it would go into effect on customer bills as a surcharge starting August first. Uh, there's a 45 day window. And then it goes on as a surcharge, so people would see it on their bill in August. It would go through PUC review. Um, last time that took uh, several months. I don't know if it'll take the same, but sometime towards the end of the year, uh, the PUC review would be likely to conclude. And if it's approved, then it would just stay on bills and be incorporated into rates. If there's any divergence uh, in terms of what they approve, uh, that would get refunded to customers at that point in time, um, or, or any change would flow to customers at that point in time. Um, we think again this year, not by quite as large a margin, but we think there's some headroom in what we're asking for relative to what we could ask for. Um, I think this year it's probably uh, less than a percentage point, uh, whereas last year it was seven and a half compared to 11.8. Um, but that still means we're hopefully making a very reasonable ask within the regulatory context and that it would be likely to be reviewed and approved, assuming our assumptions are, are correct. You mentioned earlier about um asking more regularly for rate increases and just curious as to what you mean by regularly yearly by year by oh, annually. annually 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 um i think it's prudent for us now that we're on this course to adjust rates annually um you know the, some of the utilities that have what's called an alternative regulation plan uh gmp and, and vgs actually adjust components of their rates uh quarterly um they have fuel costs that go up or down quarterly uh, sometimes they have storm costs that are reflected in different ways. Uh, we go through a more traditional regulation process where you would make a rate adjustment based on a request. Um, but I think it's in order to avoid a scenario in the future where we end up needing a larger request. Uh, and we certainly you know, heard from folks that even at the seven and a half percent after 12 years of no increase was still a burden. I think it makes sense to try to have smaller increases on a more regular uh, basis just to cover the cost of inflation, the cost of continuing to invest in our workforce, uh, you know, annual colas, things like that, uh, rather than let them pile up at some point and then have to make a larger request. So I just think it puts us on a more sustainable footing uh, from a financial standpoint. My hope would be, uh, I don't know if it'll be next year or, or the year after, but my hope would be uh, we get to a point where we're able to utilize the uh, 2% or less rate changes that don't have to go through PUC approval uh, that municipal utilities are allowed to ask for and electric cooperatives. Um, Cause that would mean that we're, we're saving time in terms of the process, but we're also asking for a very uh, relatively small amount. So we'd love to get to that type of trajectory uh, in the near future. Any questions? Have you heard uh, any response from the press release that went out today? No, um, I will say we've been more proactive about communicating with um, with the city council and with uh, customers who expressed interest during the last uh, rate change. So we've certainly engaged in multiple meetings during the course of the year with UVM and UVM Medical Center uh, because they're obviously large customers. Changes in our rates have a significant impact on their budget. Uh, so they've been well apprised of where we thought we would land. And uh, we had been telling them that we thought 4.9 was a potential. So now that it's 3.95, it's it's a slightly less impact on their budget. Um, uh, we've certainly indicated to the council earlier in the process what we thought was going to be uh, the proposed change. And, and now we'll, we'll be bringing that to them at a slightly lower level. Um, so I think we've, we've done a little more proactively. Um, and I, my hope would be that uh, customers can look at that and look at the relative uh, moderation in terms of the request and uh, that folks feel like it's a reasonable request, uh, particularly paired with the energy assistance program. But uh, our release did make note of every opportunity folks have to weigh in, uh, including this evening, but also uh, our board of finance presentation, our city council presentation, and then the PUC process. Um, last year, we did not have a customer uh, engage with us during the PUC process. And has this gone out via like front porch forum and any of that yet? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we had the news release um, 
uh, but I don't think we've had a front porch forum post. We are going to have a bill insert, as I mentioned, that'll kind of be a fiscal year 23 update uh, from me, and it'll have a page on this and then a page on some of our incentive programs. Uh, so that'll go out to every customer in the course of June. Uh, we also have in the North Avenue News, that same column will run. So we're going to let folks know through North Avenue News. Um, and we'll have this up on our website, try to make other efforts to let folks know about it. I'm just uh, <clears throat> thinking in the future, should energy ever be inexpensive? And the answer is probably no. Uh, so there's the price of this kind of energy, there's the price of efficiency, and there's the price of other kinds of energy, like gas. And the one that seems to carry the most weight is the competing energy price. So I'm just reflecting on that. So uh, the way the agenda is structured is that we had the uh, 2023 updated draft budget discussion and vote. And then at the tail end, uh, agenda item number nine is proposed 2024 rate case discussion and vote. And then you guys have the general obligation in between those. Is there a reason why we shouldn't, um, you know, vote on both of these right now? That's and what we did last year. that's what I thought. Yeah, we can okay. vote them all. Do folks have more questions or comments, or are you ready to vote? Did we discuss the G? No, that okay. that that's what I was saying. Yeah. Um, the fact that really we're going through agenda item seven and nine, right. and then we come back to eight. We we don't really have a presentation on the geo bond. Um, it's I think kind it's of boilerplate, right? Same I mean, as it yeah. always is. Consented, uh, consented yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's nice Happy to answer questions quote. if there are. Any, but. <laughs> Would someone like to make a motion? <laughs> Guys, there are only two of you and I can't do it. <laughs> I'll make the first one. We'll go back and forth here. I make a motion to approve the department's fiscal year 2023 capital and operating budgets as presented. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Well, um, we can do both. Okay. Make a motion to recommend to the Board of Finance and the City Council to authorize and direct the Chief Administrative offer, uh, Officer to pledge the credit of the city by issuing a bond app anticipation note for bonds in an amount. No, no, no. We're doing the right. Oh, sorry. That's <laughs> right. <My bad. clears throat> Try that again. I make a motion to recommend to the Board of Finance and the City Council the authorization to pursue a rate case with the Vermont Public Utility Commission in the amount of 3.95% for services rendered beginning August 1st, 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, and thank you. I know you guys, uh, I mean, we got this, I think, Saturday at about noon. Um, and I know you guys were really pushing to try and figure out how to get that rate increase as low as possible. So thank you. While also doing everything else, like making our GT run on biodiesel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not you guys, <laughs> but thank you. And it's it's never great to say, hey, here's a rate increase. But uh, the reality is things do cost more as the years tick by. Uh, so uh, second to last on the agenda, agenda number eight is the fiscal year 2023 general obligation bond. This is a discussion and vote. And this is, as was mentioned earlier, uh, a repeat visitor every year. But go for it, Emily. Sure. So at a high level, this is um, to authorize the city to pledge their credit to issue a $3 million general obligation bond to make um, electric capital improvements at BED. Um, and there's a motion for you, <laughs> if you agree. Well, discussion, no, we're ready to vote. Vote. Yeah, I just uh, for for folks who you know for viewers who may not have ever heard the background on this, I, I'd like them to not be like, oh yeah, three million. They said sure. Can you give a little <laughs> bit more background? <laughs> just sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. Sure. So the um, 
The city issues a geo bond every year, $3 million. This would direct $3 million of that geo bond to BED to support the capital projects that were outlined in the budget that we just adopted. <laughs> and any risks or concerns that viewers should know about? I don't believe so. No, it's been part of the department's capital financing structure for, I believe, quite a while. It's, it's authorized. a number of years. Right. It's authorized yeah. under the city charter. It's like since 2012. Thank you. Been. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's been here since before I started, and I think I started in 2012. So, yeah. okay. Okay, now we've given information. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, I can make a motion. Uh, I move to recommend to the Board of Finance and to the City Council to authorize and direct the Chief Administrative Officer to pledge the credit of the city. Of issuing a bond anticipation note or bonds in an amount of $3 million for the 2023 fiscal year to be used for capital improvements, additions, and replacements, and for the efficient and economical operation of the electric department. I'll second that motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, thank you. So last on the agenda is commissioner's check-in. Um, and also just thank you for doing all the prep work last month as well, because I, uh, if we hadn't had that sort of deep dive into the budget, um, this wouldn't have gone as smoothly. So just understanding the pros and the cons and the things that need to be weighed up. So thank you. Um, commissioner's check-in, anything to follow up on? Uh, I've already d done this, but I'll do it again. Thank you, Mike, for... Um Digging in the question into the question of how much BTV stat info would be available to the public. Turns out not not a lot, but anyway, uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, I went on the website today, and I guess I knew this, but our performance uh, report wasn't issued in 2021. At least it's not on the website. We did a, a website only version. It wasn't a. It wasn't a report, uh, but there is a 2021 uh, performance, or sorry, th there was a report issued in 2021. We have not yet issued one in 2022 to cover 2021. I think that's what you're Well, what you're uh, when you, I look- We have one that's in the works um, okay. for 21 data. There's a list going back to around 2009. Yeah. I think you click on each one. Right. That list ends at 2020. Yes, so that would be right because we haven't issued one in 22 and that would cover the 21 report. Uh, the last one we issued was last year and it covered 20. Okay. Uh, Sorry about as, that. Well, it makes sense. Uh, as usual, I was trying to get uh, access to as much info as I could on the Synapse recent report and all that. Um, some of that's in the state, the stuff you presented and I think then presented to city council. Is, right. there, is there anything else? I think it's in the dashboard um, yeah. that we've shared. Uh, the, a number of the metrics that are relevant or in the commission dashboard. But which was, okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, but I will ask, so there is there is that graph showing the uh, trajectory if we're yes. good and we have a little segment for yes. the first year and then we saw something about a segment for the second year, but I don't know if I can find that. I'm happy uh, to, uh, yeah, I think it was in the presentation that right, I made, right, right? right. I'm happy to send you the the slide if that's helpful. No, I, I, if it's in the presentation, I know how to get it. But okay. I, the question is, is it on the website? Oh, no, it's not on our website. No, it's it's posted on the um, board docs for, for the Board of Finance City Council uh, for the evening when we presented it. And it would be potentially in the updated PMR when we issue that. Um, but it's not currently on our website. That's right. And that PMR will come out? Um, Mike and I, I know, I think Mike's on uh, Teams. I don't know if he can chime in, but he and I have been discussing it, uh, trying to get together. We we went away from doing a printed version, so it is only online now. Um, but he and I have been discussing trying to get that together. A lot of stuff has been held up just to get through the budget and rate uh, piece here. But um, it's something that we've been actively talking about trying to get up in the next month or so. Uh, you sense what I'm... Yeah, this is... Go ahead, Mike. Hi there. Can you guys hear me? It's Mike. Yes. Yep. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say, Bob, thanks for the kind comment, Commissioner Herendine. Always glad to get your information. And um, we have a meeting actually next week, Darren, myself, Emily, about the PMR. The reason that the 2020 report was on the website, but not as a PDF, was we changed how we were presenting it to a format we think in the long run will be more informative. And we plan to do that again soon to capture what happened in 2021. Part of what we were waiting on was our synapse report from this year. So I expect the next several weeks we'll have that report up and we'll be sure to let you know. Yeah, you get the drift as a bookkeeping yep. type person. I'd like to think that's in there for somebody who wants it. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's known to most of us, yeah. but it's not there yet. Absolutely. Thank you. If I recall correctly, it's usually in about June that you and I go before the city council and give sort of an update. And that's usually when we also give the PMR. They've stopped doing that, I think, um, or at least they have over the past few years. Um, it used to be that the PMR actually came out town meeting day um, oh. and we used to issue it on town meeting day. That's no longer been viable because our synapse update doesn't typically come to us until April because they're looking at data as of you know, year end, December 31st. So it takes several months to get all the relevant data. So the last couple of years, I think we've been looking at the PMR being something that we publish in the May, June timeframe. Um, I don't know if they're gonna restart the kind of the annual updates that we had been doing um, or not, but if, if they did, it would be helpful to have that kind of simultaneous. Um, but I haven't heard anything. Yeah. Me neither. Normally there's some coordination for dates. I asked last year and I think last year they had decided not to proceed with it. I don't know if that was a pandemic related you know, challenge that maybe we'll start that again. Uh, well, what I'm hearing um, is, Mike, it would be great when that's up and ready. Um, and, and also it sounds like perhaps the format, if, if it was still possible to have a PDF that was downloadable, that might, if it wasn't a huge amount of work, um, that might be uh, helpful for folks who tend to print information like that in a sort of PDF way. Am I... Am I understanding what you're saying, Commissioner Herendine? Well, I hadn't put it that way, but I think I think it's great. I mean, I'd like it to be accessible. Uh, should it be downloadable? Seems to me that's probably uh, marginally easy to do. So why not? But maybe it's not. But if it isn't, I'd like it to be on the website. Right. So, Mike, maybe you can look into that and just let us know how it goes now that you've heard sort of what the what the ask is. Absolutely, we'll do. Thank you, Mike. Other items? No? Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot for your hard work. Uh, and as always, feel free to reach out to viewers, uh, to Mike Kenrick or anybody else here at the team. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. All in favor. Aye. <laughs> Aye. Thank you. 657 May 18th. Thank you, everybody.